There are so many ways to make airplanes safer. For example, they could have ejector seats so that every passenger could be rescued. In reality, though, it's way more difficult than it sounds. If there were ejector seats, your trip would be very different. Everyone would have to be strapped into a seat with a harness to make sure they wouldn't fall out of it. Then you would have to wear an oxygen mask all throughout the flight. An emergency can occur at any time. Then, ejection in itself is a big pressure on your body. Even fighter pilots who are physically prepared can still suffer severe injuries. For an average person, this process wouldn't be safe. So, however cool it sounds, ejection seats aren't very practical and are actually quite dangerous. Okay, well, at least they could have a parachute for each passenger. But this wouldn't be very useful either. Parachutes only sound like they can save many lives. First, having them isn't efficient. They're very costly and heavy. So a plane would need to burn more fuel while flying if there were parachutes on board. It would all be worth it, though, if parachutes could make an actual difference to the safety of people. But they can't. Commercial planes aren't designed in a way that would make it safe to jump out of them, especially with a couple hundred people on board. Next, passengers aren't trained to use them. Imagine there's an emergency. The plane is falling, and 200 people are trying to deal with a parachute for the first time in their lives. It would be an absolute mess. Lastly, it's not safe to jump from the high altitudes planes fly at. So, oxygen masks, life vests, and boats are the best life-saving equipment, and every plane has those. You know those huge engines that they have under the wings? Yeah, look at them. They don't look safe at all. Birds can get pulled in, and it actually happens. They could at least put a grate in front of the rotating parts to prevent birds from getting in there. Turns out those engines pull inside huge amounts of air, and this is crucial for them to work properly. The more air gets swallowed, the more air gets compressed, mixed with fuel, and burned. And then, more of it gets pushed out from the other side, keeping the plane going. A cover at the front would be a barrier, significantly reducing the air inflow that is crucial for the proper work of the engines, and this would endanger the passengers. But hey, don't be too upset. Birds fly way lower than planes do, so they're only in danger for a few minutes at the beginning of the flight while the plane is climbing altitude, and at the very end when the plane is landing. So very few of them ever get pulled in, and if they do, it's never a threat to the engines or passenger safety. Planes also don't change up the gears like cars do, so technically they can't go backwards. The reason for this is that planes don't need to go backwards. They can just turn around and move in the opposite direction, but face first. The only time when they need to move backward is when they have to get to the gate. And for those times, there's help. Pushback tractors. Those are small vehicles that can connect to airplanes and move them in the required direction. Watch out for those next time you fly. But technically speaking, planes can go backward if the engines start pushing the air forward instead of backward. But this is very dangerous for everyone around. One of the very few cases when they do it is during landing to help slow the airplane down. There are cameras on the outside that let pilots navigate taxiways better. They come in especially handy during tricky maneuvering. But do you know there are also cameras in airplane cabins? You can relax, there are no cameras in the lavatories. But yes, they are there in the cabin and for security reasons only. Flight attendants monitor them to see what's not visible from their own seats. Of course, flight attendants can check everything just by walking down the cabin, and that's exactly what they do most of the time. So, cameras are mostly used during takeoff and landing, when everyone, including flight attendants, is supposed to sit down, as those are the most dangerous stages of a flight. Notice that it's exactly during these stages that the rules are particularly strict. All electronic devices should be turned off or put on airplane mode, and big electronic devices should be stored away. Window blinds should be raised and tables folded. Seats should be put in the upright position. You need to have your seatbelt fastened, and so on. This is all done for safety and to ensure fast evacuation in case of emergency. So let's discuss these rules. 
Airplane mode on electronic devices is important to make sure that the signals that devices transmit don't interfere with the plane's electronic systems. If they interfere, they will block the radio's frequency pilots need to get their instructions. Do you remember that clicking sound a speaker makes right before your cell phone gets a call if the two devices are closed? This is the sound pilots might hear while communicating with air traffic control. Now, putting away large devices like laptops is important because they might turn into obstacles if you need to get out of the plane fast in case of an emergency. All the pathways should be as clear as possible. This is why everything should be packed away, seats straightened, and tables folded. There should be nothing blocking anyone's way. And lastly, window blinds. The lights on the airplane get turned off too. Those two things are done to make sure your eyes get used to the natural light outside the aircraft. Imagine it's night, some emergency happens, and the lights that were left on suddenly go off. People need to evacuate as fast as possible, but their eyes aren't adjusted to the dark yet, and they can't see anything. This will slow everyone down. If the lights inside are out, people get used to the darkness and will be able to evacuate faster. The same goes for window blinds. If it's day and they are raised, people are used to the light outside and can evacuate faster. Another reason is that when blinds are raised during landing, people outside can see what's going on inside the plane. For example, if there's fire or smoke and where exactly. This way, they can plan the evacuation process better. Also, you might have noticed black triangles drawn above some windows on the airplane. These triangles mark the seats from which the view on the airplane's wings is the best. It's needed for the crew to find the spot as fast as possible if, in case of emergency, they need to inspect the engines, slats, or flaps. This little triangle saves the plane crew a lot of time. We do talk about emergencies a lot, but they really don't happen often. It's more dangerous to drive a car than to fly by plane, and most of us get in the car every day. Yet, the fear of flying is still very much out there, and people can get superstitious. In many cultures, the number 13 is considered unlucky. So, airplane companies that often fly to those destinations just omit row 13. It's a small thing to do, but it can spare a few anxious passengers who happen to sit in row 13. In other cultures, like in Italy and Brazil, 17 is the unlucky number, and some aircraft have both rows 13 and 17 missing. In airplanes that fly to China, they can often omit row 14 instead. Want to catch a glimpse of what flying might look like in the future? Then you're in the right place. Economy class lie flat bunk beds, vertical flying vehicles, AI powered in flight meal service. Buckle up and let's start our flight. But first, I need to ask you have you ever heard of the Crystal Cabin Awards? Oh, those are like the Oscars of aviation interior design. And here are some of the most recent winners Meet Sky Nest, a lie flat bed for people traveling in economy class. These nests are supposed to be used on long-haul flights. The design is based on a sleep pod island located in the middle of the plane. And you can book a four-hour time slot if you want to take a real nap during your flight. The best news is that this design is likely to be introduced next year. While traveling in premium economy on long routes, you'll be able to use smarter seating design. It includes wider seats and twin armrests, which means no more fighting for space with your neighbors. Plus, there will be fully flexible rows with cushions that can be elevated, creating lie-flat beds. Lufthansa Group has promised that premium passengers will be able to book suites with double beds and travel on temperature-controllable heated or cooled seats. As you see, these days, airline companies are working hard on new designs of aircraft cabins, and it might impact the entire future of air travel. At the moment, they focus on travelers' experience within the walls of the plane. As a result, we have some mind-boggling products. 
check out Singapore Airlines First Class Suites or Air France's La Première cabin, which is believed to become one of the best first class cabins in the skies. It's going to feature suites equipped with separate sofas and chairs, and each suite will have five windows along the cabin wall. This will make it the longest first class suite in the world. But then, Airbus went and patented the idea of a more interactive flight experience, especially for those lucky passengers occupying window seats. With the help of special eye tracking equipment, the aircraft might be able to highlight significant objects you're looking at and provide you with detailed information, appearing on a semi transparent display on the window. The patent also claims that you could send data to devices connected by Bluetooth or Wi Fi. This way, Takeoffs and landings would get much more exciting, and you'd be able to get information about a new country or city. Qatar Airlines, in turn, came up with the idea of Q Suites. It looks like this on the sides, you have individual suites, while the middle part can be transformed. You can choose to have a double suite to travel together with your partner, or you can have some private space. Or even move the walls and turn the place into a quad suite that you can use for a meeting. There might also be some improvements in economy class. They're bound to bring more comfort, especially on a long haul flight. A company called Zodiac Seats filed a patent based on a zigzag configuration of seats. Look at this aisle, which contains three and four seats, with each of them facing in the opposite direction. This allows for way more shoulder space than regular seating. Plus, passengers have a lot of leg space. Yes, some people might feel a bit uncomfortable having to face their neighbor for more than eight hours straight, but aren't these space improvements worth it? Now, you might know that moving around the cabin while flight attendants are serving meals and beverages is kind of tricky. Plus, you have to eat at a specific time with everyone else. Or, if you're not feeling hungry, forego the meal altogether. Well, robots might be the solution. One company has suggested using perfectly sized pods that could slide along the rail in the middle of the aisle, delivering drinks and food ordered by passengers. This way, you could get your meal at the most suitable time for you without leaving your seat. This solution is likely to solve the problems with meal service. Even better, it might allow for fewer galleys and large planes. Unfortunately, this idea was filed 60 years ago and hasn't been implemented yet. So maybe it's not as great as it sounds. Another idea connected with in flight meal service includes using AI. According to its creators, the technology will record what passengers leave on their trays and later use this data to suggest various catering plans on subsequent flights. Now, even though these innovations sound like they're going to make traveling way more comfortable, they're not exactly revolutionary. But look at these innovations vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. Hyundai Transys's air taxi cabin concept optimizes space and prioritizes your privacy in a shared cabin. If we talk about short flights, there's City Airbus Next Gen. That's an all electric, vertical takeoff and landing vehicle with four seats based on the lift and cruise concept. It can operate within the range of 50 miles and has a cruise speed of 74 miles per hour. Another amazing prospect is passenger aircraft with AI co pilots, or even pilots. Some experts claim that planes could potentially be flown on a fully automated basis. Not everyone agrees with this idea, though. A skilled pilot is part of a complicated safety system that reduces risks and keeps passengers safe. Pilots have to be navigators, technicians, engineers, and weather experts. On a regular working day, a pilot needs to deal with ground crew, other air crew, cabin crew, air traffic control, and passengers. That's a lot. And don't forget that they need to communicate well, not only in aviation terms, but also on an interpersonal level. Will AI be able to do the same? Time will tell. But let's get back to the boldest ideas about the future of air travel. Some experts think that sometime around 2040, you'll be able to catch a hypersonic plane ride. 
Lots of people believe that the era of supersonic planes finished in 2003 when the Concorde commercial airplane was decommissioned after decades of being unprofitable. But it seems the situation might change soon. New supersonic aircraft will fly at incredible heights, and their speed is likely to be at least six times the speed of any other passenger plane. Traveling from New York to London, in this case, will take less than two hours. By comparison, these days, it takes a conventional airplane eight hours to fly from one of these cities to the other. There is one problem, though. The supersonic plane tickets will cost a lot. And statistically, people tend to prioritize price over speed. So experts don't think that a lot of people will be eager to pay a few thousand dollars to get from London to Sydney in four hours. Plus, such planes will need a lot of liquid hydrogen fuel, and at the moment, it's not cheap. By the way, you might not recognize a plane from 2050. These flying machines will keep changing for the next several decades, and the chances are high that, at some moment, windows will start to disappear from airplanes altogether. This way, aircraft will become stronger and better suited for high speeds. Windows make planes heavier which results in larger fuel consumption. No wonder cargo planes don't have windows. Planes will also become sleeker and will likely be covered with solar panels. There's also a concept of a plane with its cabin made out of transparent polymers. I don't know about you, but I don't think I'd ever board such a plane. Talk about aerophobia. The chances are that in a few decades, we'll see a hypersonic plane with a jet engine that can turn into a rocket that can fly into space. Liquid oxygen would get injected into the exhaust, turning the engine into a rocket. It would help the aircraft reach enormous speeds. And on the way back, the engine would turn into a regular jet engine once again. Have you ever watched an action-packed Hollywood film where an airplane gets a hole in its side and everyone starts freaking out? Stuff starts flying all over the place and people are barely staying in their seats. Well, in real life, a small hole in the plane's body isn't going to cause that much drama. However, I have an incredible story to tell you about a pilot who actually managed to land a plane with half of its roof missing. Can you believe it? Make sure your seatbelt is fastened because this one is going to be a wild ride. On April 28, 1988, a Boeing 737 owned by Aloha Airlines took off from Hilo International Airport en route to Honolulu. Before this flight, the plane had already flown three short trips from Honolulu to Hilo, Maui, and Kauai. Everything was chill that day, and the weather was nice and calm. It looked like smooth sailing all the way. The captain of the flight was Robert Shorn Steimer, and the co-pilot was Madeline Tompkins, both experienced pilots with thousands of flight hours in the Boeing 737. Bright and early that morning, before taking off from Honolulu, Madeline did the regular pre-flight inspection and said that everything was good to go. At 11 a.m., they took off from Honolulu and went to Maui, then Hilo. When they got to Hilo, they didn't leave the cockpit or check the plane from the outside. It wasn't a requirement, so why bother? At 1.25 p.m., the plane took off for the final leg of the round trip, with 95 people on board. 89 passengers, two pilots, three flight attendants, and an FAA traffic controller who sat in the observer seat in the cockpit. The plane had taken off like normal and reached its cruising altitude of 24,000 feet without any hiccups. But then, 26 miles from Kahului, things went totally haywire. The pilots heard a loud whooshing sound, followed by a crack and then a rush of wind that was so loud it was deafening. Turns out, a small section of the roof on the left side had come loose, causing the plane to decompress explosively. And to make matters even worse, the decompression caused a chain reaction that led to a huge chunk of the plane's roof ripping off completely. That missing part was a massive 18.5 feet long and was part of the skin that covered the plane from the cockpit all the way back to the forewing area. The pilots didn't have a clue what was going on when the disaster struck. The first officer, who was the one in charge of the plane at that time, suddenly felt her head snap back, and then she saw a bunch of gray insulation and debris flying around the cockpit like it was a tornado. 
Meanwhile, the captain took a look around and was shocked to see that the cockpit door was nowhere to be seen, and instead of the first-class ceiling, he was staring straight up at the sky. The plane started to tilt from side to side, making it challenging to keep it under control. The crew in the cockpit quickly put on their oxygen masks, and the captain took over control of the plane. He then initiated an emergency descent towards the nearest airport on Maui Island. Luckily, all the passengers were seated, and most of them had their seatbelts fastened since the seatbelt sign was still on. Unfortunately, the three flight attendants were caught off guard. One of them was near the hole and was pulled out of the plane. The other two were thrown to the floor, with one of them hitting her head hard and losing consciousness. The third attendant tried to help the passengers and keep them calm. At the same time, the pilots were desperately trying to let air traffic control know that they were in trouble. But there were communication problems even between themselves due to the loud noise and the fact that they were wearing oxygen masks. They had to resort to hand signals to understand each other. Moreover, they were unsure whether their messages were being heard by ATC. The plane's controls were not responding properly, which made the captain's job of flying the plane even harder. The first officer was doing her best to assist the captain and communicate with the tower. It was only after the plane descended to an altitude of 14,000 feet that the controller finally received their distress call and immediately started making arrangements for an emergency landing. The control tower wasn't prepared for a situation like this, though. In fact, the tower had to call 911, just like any other regular person would do in case of an emergency. The problem was that the controller didn't understand the severity of the situation, and they didn't realize that the passengers and crew members would need medical help. This was because the crew had only reported a rapid decompression and hadn't explained the entire situation in detail. The plane was in a very bad mess, but the captain was doing everything he could to safely land the plane. As they descended towards the airport, the captain commanded the first officer to lower the landing gear, but the indicator light didn't turn on. The plane also had an issue with the left engine, which failed as they approached the runway. Despite these problems, the captain used the reverse thrust of the working engine to try and land the plane. It was a difficult and dangerous task, but they managed to land the plane safely on the runway. The passengers and crew members were then evacuated from the plane. It was a miracle that everyone survived, however 65 people were injured. They had been hit by debris and pieces of the plane's body that were flying around. Unfortunately, the ground staff wasn't aware of the severity of the situation and didn't have enough resources to provide immediate medical assistance to the injured passengers. The first ambulance arrived seven minutes after the plane landed, which wasn't an ideal scenario. Furthermore, there were only two ambulances on the entire island, which couldn't accommodate all the injured people. As a result, tour vans were used to transport the passengers to the hospital. Fortunately, two drivers who were former paramedics provided immediate first aid to the injured right on the runway. Meanwhile, the airport mechanics and office staff took the vans to the hospital, which was located three miles away. Despite the chaotic and stressful circumstances, only eight people suffered severe injuries, but they all later made a full recovery. The plane was in really bad shape, though, and it was no wonder it couldn't handle the stress of the decompression incident. Despite its age not being a problem, it had experienced a whole lot of takeoffs and landings, which took a toll on its integrity. The salty and humid environment it operated in only added to the damage. You see, planes are designed to withstand a certain number of flight cycles, and this plane had exceeded that number by a long shot. The majority of its flights were short domestic ones, which meant it had to take off and land way more times than it was designed for. This is what ultimately led to the roof coming off during the flight. The poor condition of the plane meant that it was beyond repair and had to be dismantled right there at the airport. What's interesting is that in an interview after the accident, one passenger recalled that she had noticed a crack in the plane's fuselage while she was boarding. She didn't tell the flight crew about it because she didn't think it was worth it, so they didn't know to check it. It's important to remember that these types of accidents are very rare nowadays. Major airlines and airports take numerous steps to ensure safety. And according to Harvard University, the chances of being in an airplane accident are about 1 in 1.2 million. And that's a tiny percentage, and I don't know about you, but I find that very comforting. And even if something did happen, such as the roof of the plane coming off, 
It's reassuring to know that the pilots are trained to handle emergencies and can still land the plane safely. Welcome aboard our flight from London to Miami. It will take us four hours and 30 minutes. The weather in Miami is... Wait, did the pilot just say four hours and a half? It sounds like a dream, but it will most likely become our reality in less than 10 years from now. Boom Supersonic, an aircraft manufacturer, is working on a passenger supersonic jet called the Overture that will be able to carry 65 to 80 people at twice the speed of current commercial aircraft. One of the major American airlines is interested in buying around 40 planes. The plane that's going to cost $200 million has recently passed the wind tunnel tests. If all goes well, the first finished Overture prototype will roll off the line in 2025 and will travel at nearly twice the speed of sound. The plane will be able to show its top speed over the sea, so it should be ideal for transatlantic flights. And then, traveling from, say, New York to Paris should take no longer than four hours. But first, it will have to get all the official permissions to do it. Some people are skeptical about the whole passenger superjet concept as they remember the story of the Concorde. That high-end plane delivered people from London to New York in about three hours and serviced other transatlantic connections. The tickets cost a whopping $10,000 per seat and passengers got access to a super exclusive lounge with lobster and Angus beef for lunch. The Concorde went on its final commercial flight in 2003. It was a huge fuel guzzler. Plus, there are many complaints from people living near airports about the noise it produced. The Overture is supposed to be more fuel efficient, lighter, and have better software to make it more aerodynamic. The noise might still be a problem though, because supersonic aircraft need aerodynamic engines which are pretty loud. That will definitely change in the future, as planes have gone a long way since their first flight in 1903. Back then, the Wright brothers started the Aerial Age with a 12-second flight traveling 120 feet in North Carolina. The top speed at that time was around 30 miles per hour, but it still seemed pretty impressive. The world's first passenger airline service took off just 11 years later. The flight from St. Petersburg, Florida to Tampa, Florida lasted 23 minutes. Covering the distance by car around the bay took about 20 hours, so that was a great time saver. The tickets cost $5 and were sold out 16 weeks in advance, but the airline went out of business in four months. The new age in aviation began in the 1950s when they introduced the turbofan engine. It became possible as they started using temperature-resistant materials and complex air cooling systems. Planes also became lighter as they were made of composite materials. The wings have also improved over the years. The airfoil, that's the part thanks to which the air travels faster above the wing than below it, became a real game changer. Thanks to it, the planes keep a low speed during takeoff, which means they move smoothly and burn less fuel. The fastest plane in the world so far is North American X-15. It was rocket-powered and made of aluminum and titanium. A huge wedge tail helped it stay stable at that super speed. The rocket plane set the world's altitude record, reaching an altitude of 67 miles. Oh, and to make it even more impressive, it happened back in 1967. So, if it was possible back then already, why don't we all just fly rocket planes, or at least supersonics? especially on long-distance flights. In terms of speed, passenger planes are still where they were 50 years ago, mostly because speeding flights up would also make them way more expensive. Flying faster means burning more fuel. Plus, supersonic engines are expensive to produce and maintain. Another reason is natural forces. The winds affect the speed of a plane, and no technology can control the wind. A strong tailwind can help it move forward at a higher speed, and a headwind can slow the aircraft down. Planes mostly fly at altitudes of up to 7 miles. Up there, the air is thinner, which means there's less resistance and a plane can fly faster and save some fuel. Also, the lower temperatures make the jet engines more efficient. Another perk of flying through that part of the atmosphere is that it's less turbulent, so flights go smoother. 
private jets can't fly that high. They're smaller, and their engines aren't strong enough to reach such an altitude, so they stick around to 15,000 feet. Ever notice those white trails that planes leave behind? Their official name is contrails, and they're like artificial clouds planes leave behind. When the plane reaches its cruising altitude, temperatures get quite low, about negative 67 degrees Fahrenheit, and the water turns into particles of ice. The higher the level of humidity is, the bigger those trails get, and you can see them long after the plane has disappeared. So, thick and long contrails can be a sign of an upcoming storm. Sometimes contrails can even be colorful. The droplets of water that are formed up in the atmosphere can freeze in different sizes. They all reflect sunlight at different wavelengths, causing the effect of a rainbow. When all the colors mix, it appears white, the most common contrail color. Airplanes don't take off with the wind, but actually against it. It's kind of like a kite. To make it fly, you launch it against the wind, and there it goes. That's because there are four forces of flight, lift, weight, thrust, and drag. The lift is generated because the speed of the air is higher above the kite than below it. The kite is pushed upwards. This is the lifting force. Going through a storm is one pretty scary experience, but is it really as dangerous as it seems? In fact, the most critical moments in windy weather are takeoff and landing. Plane manufacturers test their aircraft and specify speed limits at which the pilots should move in different weather conditions. At some airports, the winds are pretty severe all year round, so landing can get pretty wobbly. It requires a real pro of a pilot to land when the wind strikes the runway. Sometimes, the wind unexpectedly changes its speed and direction. The pilot really has to know what they're doing to land when the wind direction changes. Otherwise, the risk of overshooting the runway is pretty real. Extreme heat is another weather condition that can stop a plane from flying. Airplanes fly by generating lift with their wings. The air below the wings takes the plane up. In extreme heat, an airplane can't produce that much lift. That's because hot air expands and becomes way less dense than cold air. With less lift, the plane may find it really hard to take off and fly. Electronics will unlikely respond well to extreme heat or humidity, and the AC system may fail. Smaller jets can't operate at a temperature of over 118 degrees Fahrenheit. Larger Airbus and Boeing planes perform the best below 126 degrees Fahrenheit. Those mysterious chimes you hear during the flight are a kind of a secret language the crew uses to communicate with each other. The chime you hear shortly after takeoff informs the crew that the landing gear is getting retracted. A single chime during the flight is a sign that one of the passengers needs the assistance of the crew. When they're serving meals and run out of food and drinks, they can ask their colleagues to share using a high and low chime combo. Three low tones means serious turbulence is approaching, so the crew needs to buckle up. Have you ever noticed the flashing light in the cabin before takeoff? You have nothing to worry about. It occurs when the pilot disconnects a plane from the airport power supply and it switches to the onboard one. This rapid transition may cause flashing. Pilots can't eat similar meals when they're working. Imagine that you're on a transoceanic flight. The airplane is flying over the Pacific Ocean. Flight attendants deliver the dinner meals. Everyone is enjoying the pasta. The sauce tastes a bit funny though. Hmm, that's probably okay. After all, you are eating an aircraft meal. It can't taste like a five-star chef plate. Time goes by. Oh no, you were right. Something was indeed wrong with the food. But if all the passengers have the same problem, so do the pilots. To prevent both of them being out of order, pilots are advised not to eat the same meal at the same time. In such a scenario, if one pilot feels bad, the other one can take over. I mean, this is not an imperative rule stated by the Federal Aviation Administration, but most airlines make their own rules about this matter. Flight attendants have access to hidden equipment, such as a defibrillator, supplemental oxygen, a fire extinguisher, and duct tape. But probably the most interesting gear they have is handcuffs. These objects are there to protect passengers from others, and sometimes from themselves. Turns out that flight attendants have everything they need to defuse a troublemaker. 
Aviator sunglasses look cool on pilots in movies, but in real life, they don't wear polarized glasses. First off, they have a glare-reducing effect. This can cause some trouble in the cockpit. A pilot has to read instruments, but the stuff in the cockpit, such as LCD displays, emits polarized light. So a pilot with those cool polarized glasses can't read the displays with 100% efficiency. Pilots shouldn't wear these glasses simply because of safety concerns. Imagine a shimmer of glare coming from another plane's windscreen, but the pilot missed the sign because of polarized sunglasses. Ever noticed a hole in the tail of an airplane? Well, most commercial airplanes have it. Next time you get into an airplane, take a closer look. The hole has a fancy name, auxiliary power unit. It looks like a hole from the outside, but that is actually a hidden turbine engine. Most of the time, the APU will remain off for the entire flight. It will start working when the plane lands. It provides power to the cabin lights, air conditioning, and cockpit electronics. Don't underestimate the APU's power, though. It can also provide the power required to start the main engines. You've watched a bright side video and learned what the APU is. A perfect icebreaker. Unfortunately, you're not in a chatty mood. You just want to take the plane, land, and start your vacation. Yet again, there is only one door to board. You are at the end of a queue. Why don't planes generally have multiple doors? According to the experts, the biggest issue is that the bridge takes up a lot of space. When an aircraft is loaded from the front and the rear, it takes up two slots. This is not ideal for the administrators. Newly remodeled or constructed terminals tend to have dual boarding compared to the older terminals. Change of scenery, let's jump into a cruise ship. There are hidden passageways and secret doors in ships. These secrets are from an insider. Staff on the ship mostly work in their designated area. How does a worker get from one place to another? without using the stairs and doors that the passengers use. There is a network of corridors and stairs all around the ship, used only by the crew. I mean it when I say secret doors. They blend with the walls, so they go undetected by those who don't know where the door is. Maybe you can stumble by accident. Here is a clue. Pay attention to the walls near the guest stairs. Try to think of those gigantic cruise ships as floating metals. This leads me to a cruise cabin fun fact. The walls of the cruise ship cabin are magnetic. Imagine you're traveling to multiple countries on board a cruise ship, a single month voyage. You collect destination themed magnets and decorate your cabin. True cruise fans know this magnet magic, so they put a couple of magnetic hooks into their luggage. Neat tip, use magnetic hooks to add extra storage in your cabin. Hang clothes and accessories, postcards or hats. Speaking of ships, why do some ships and boats have small holes constantly releasing water? To keep the bilge free of water. Water builds up over time inside the bilge, and the bilge pump automatically pumps the water out again. Ships don't have headlights. Using a headlight could prevent accidents. If they work for cars, why not for ships? Headlights are the source of light, but the light that comes out of them bounces back at the light source at some point. With cars, for instance, headlights work because the area you want lit is narrow, and you can easily take action if you see an obstacle on the road. For ships, this is super hard. The light source should be powerful enough to light the area the captain wants to see. Large cargo ships, for instance, need more than a mile to stop or take action. Plus, imagine how much brighter should the ship's light be to light the whole area in front of it. They do see each other with different sorts of lights called navigation lights. These are small, but practical. They arrange it in a standardized way so that ships could see each other. The exciting thing is that they don't just notice one another in the dark. They also understand each other's movements and directions. Here's an example. Imagine a ship with two nav lights. The one on the front is lower, near the ship floor. The other one on the back is high up. This means the vessel goes to the right. It can safely pass by the other ships without hitting them. Trains don't have seatbelts. A bit weird. Every time there is a crash related to trains, this matter comes up. Pretty much nowhere in the world seatbelts are used on trains. Various studies have been made about this issue. Some of them created simulations of accidents, and the results were surprising. Using a seatbelt on a train could potentially increase the number of injuries. 
In cars, seat belts are highly effective in protecting the passenger and are used all the time. The logic behind the seat belt is to protect the person when a collision causes rapid deceleration. But trains carry so much momentum that they don't stop rapidly. On a plane, passengers use a seat belt on takeoff, during landing, and if turbulence occurs. There are no such things for trains. Entering and leaving a station is not a high risk. Experts believe focusing and making investments are other ways to improve railway safety. Now, you are traveling by train. You look outside the window. There are small stones along the railway tracks to accompany you on the journey. Those stones are formerly known as track ballast. They do a very important job. They provide support to and maintain the tracks. They're not there by mere coincidence, though. Now look at the stones closer. You can notice that there is no single smoothly cut stone on the tracks, because they're not regular stones randomly poured at the rails. Each rock has sharp and abrupt edges. Sharp edges hold on to each other. They protect the railroad from harsh concussions. They facilitate water drainage in heavy rain and keep down the grass and other weeds. Now imagine replacing those with round pebbles. They will slide down. Eventually, the ballast will spread out and tracks will fall apart. The last thing you would want, especially if you were a passenger on that train. It seems strange that a commercial jet doesn't have keys to turn it on. But it's a bit more complicated than just turning a key. Instead, there's a series of buttons and dials on the control board that starts the complicated process. A battery provides the power to the aircraft that is charged through a small electric generator within the jet's tail. Airflow gets in and moves into the jet's engines to keep them cool. A reserve power then warms the turbines by turning them slowly until they start spinning at the right rate. Then, the engines can be turned on one at a time. With up to four engines on a commercial jet, this entire process can take up to 90 minutes. Planes don't have keys to lock the doors either, but when they sit idle, jets have security guards constantly monitoring them. But even if someone happened to get past them, it wouldn't be a quick getaway. When you enter the plane, the captain keeps a close eye on the boarding process. They are not only in command of the flight deck, but also of the passenger's cabin. To become a commercial pilot, you got to have a distance vision of at least 20-20. But depending on the airline, it's sometimes okay if your perfect vision is assisted with glasses. It's time to find a seat on the plane. You checked in late, and you've already had an unpleasant experience of not getting on your flight like that in the past. This is because airlines purposely overbook their flights, just in case there are no-shows or cancellations. So, you didn't get to choose your seat this time. You walk past the front seats in jealousy. There are seats that are always taken much faster because everyone wants to leave the plane as soon as possible after it lands. But if you're choosing safety over early departure, the back is the place to be. It's estimated to be 40% safer in the rear end of the plane. Maybe you prefer to drive instead of flying? The chances of something dangerous happening to a plane during a flight are 1 in 11 million. Compare it to the likelihood of a car accident, which is 1 in 5,000. You've been placed at the emergency exit. Excellent! More legroom! Over the past 30 years, legroom has been decreasing more with every year. Up to 5 inches on some airlines. No, you haven't been getting taller. The reason behind this is the more people they're able to fit in, the more money the airline makes. Airlines don't build their own aircraft and use factory-made planes. From there, each airline will determine its own seating structure. This is also why the seats don't line up with the windows. But it doesn't matter, you have the best seat, although it's always a bit concerning when sitting next to an emergency door. What if you accidentally knocked it while asleep and opened it? Relax, it's actually impossible to open these doors while flying. The air pressure inside pushes against every square inch of the cabin. On the door itself, this pressure equates to 1,000 pounds across every square foot of the door. But even if you somehow developed Hulk-like strength in your sleep, you still wouldn't be able to open it as there's a series of electrical and mechanical devices that latch it closed. The extra measures are important as the moment the door opens, the entire cabin temperature would quickly drop, and that drastic change in pressure would weaken the plane's structure. It's time for takeoff, and they've asked you to turn your phone off. Should you really? 
10% of people have admitted that they don't turn theirs off and don't even set them to airplane mode. Cell phones can cause issues, but they don't disrupt the electronics as you might believe. There is a genuine concern that while you're flying in the air, your phone can receive signals from multiple towers on the ground, providing stronger distractions for the pilots. So let's make their job a little easier and turn it off. The plane has reached 40,000 feet, your ears have popped, and the seatbelt sign is turned off. The flight attendant walks down the aisle with their arms held outward. Within such a thin passage, they walk this way as it helps with their balance. They try to avoid disrupting passengers, so they don't use the headrest of the seats. And in case of sudden turbulence, there are special grabbing spots under the overhead luggage bay. It's estimated that half a million people are flying in the sky at any given time. So right now, you're part of that special group involving 0.1% of the world's population. You look out the window and notice the white wings. Planes are painted white and other lighter colors as well to help reflect solar radiation. This avoids damage from the sun by reducing the amount of heat the plane receives. But further in the distance, dark clouds approach and the plane is heading towards a thunderstorm. Since it's made of metal, it has to be a big electric conductor, right? Thankfully, jets are fitted with an aluminum shell that conducts electricity very well. The cabin's interior is completely shielded from lightning, protecting electrical systems and leaving us carbon-based mammals unhurt. A plane is so perfectly built for electrical storms that it's one of the safest places to be. There haven't been any major incidents from a storm since the 1960s. You're thirsty and you're aware that you should have brought your own water. When aircrafts land at each location, they refill their water supplies. The water quality in a plane is based on where they collected the vital liquid. Many things contribute to the water quality of every airport. Water cabinets, trucks, carts, and hoses all could be of different standards. In 2019, an airline water study found that most airlines weren't providing clean water, so the general recommendation is to only drink water from a sealed bottle and avoid even tea but the food is perfectly fine. As you sit back down, you notice the cabin is cold. Super cold, to be honest. It's intentionally set to around 71 degrees Fahrenheit, for a good reason. When people become vulnerable to fainting, it's due to not receiving enough oxygen. And when there's warm air mixed with high cabin pressure, fainting becomes more common. So, while the cold air is helping those who need it, you've been provided with a blanket for your comfort. Warmed up with a blanket, you notice the dry air running through your nose, and it dehydrates your lips and eyes. But don't worry, the air is completely safe and very clean. 40% of the air is recycled and goes through a thorough cleaning system to remove all dust and airborne bacteria, and the other 60% comes from the outside. The humidity levels in the air get very low, and that's why you feel all that discomfort. It's now dark outside as the plane begins its descent to land and the lights are dimmed. The dimmed lights aren't for the pilots or crew or those at the airport, they're for you. If something goes wrong while landing when it's dark, they'll have to start an emergency procedure. The dimmed lights are there to help your eyes adjust and help you follow towards the exit in the dark easier. But luckily, today, it won't be necessary as your journey has come to an end. Is the sky like a desert? Can a commercial aircraft fly faster than the speed of sound? Can you fix a plane with a piece of tape? Let's check your intuition with this cool truth or myth airplane quiz. Make sure to note down your correct answers and share your score in the comments. So, the first one for you. Commercial airplanes are more fuel efficient than your car. True or false? That's actually true. Commercial flights have been more fuel efficient per person per mile than cars for more than a decade. Better technologies and a larger number of people that fit in one plane have decreased the energy intensity of traveling by air by almost 74%. As for cars, it's been just a 57% drop. Okay, how about this one? There's no row 13 on a plane. Well, come to think of it, I've never seen a 13A or any other letter on my boarding pass. What about you? That's true, but only partially. 
In those countries where the number 13 is considered unlucky, there's really no row 13. But in other countries, the missing number may differ depending on what is believed to bring bad luck there. Opening a plane door during the flight is a real safety risk. It sounds kind of terrifying to me, but is it true? You can relax, that's just a myth. For one thing, the doors are locked, but even if they weren't, no one can open the door of a flying plane. It's physically impossible. The cabin pressure won't allow anybody to do it. When an airplane is at cruising altitude, it's pressurized. The difference between the inside and outside is huge. In other words, the pressure inside the cabin pushes on the door and doesn't allow anyone to open it from the inside. Even better, the airplane door is called a plug door. Its inner edge is wider than the outer. That's why it acts like a bathtub drain stopper, corking the doorway without falling through. Your skin is drier on a plane than it would be in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Can you believe this? And if you think this is true, you're absolutely right. The airplane cabin is pressurized, and the humidity there is set to 20%. For comparison, in the Sahara Desert, the average air humidity is around 25%, and your skin is used to at least 40% of humidity. That's why your nose and throat feel so dry when you're flying. Several years ago, someone posted a photo on the internet that became viral in no time. In this image, there was an airline technician, and he seemed to be fixing a plane with duct tape. So the question is, could it be true? Or was it just a fake? The answer isn't so simple. It wasn't your regular duct tape. So partially, this fact is a myth. But it was some kind of tape, known as speed tape. It costs around $700 per roll. It's actually an aluminum adhesive you can use to temporarily mend minor damage until you can repair it properly. Is it true that pilots avoid the Bermuda Triangle? After all, it has such a notorious reputation. Ships and planes simply disappear into thin air in this region. This one is certainly a myth. Today, people already know that there's no particular danger in the Bermuda Triangle, and planes fly over this area as usual. Airplanes mostly fly on their own, with autopilots doing all the work. Myth or truth? What's your bet? It's a widespread myth. Many people are sure that planes are some super automated mechanisms that can fly mostly by themselves, and pilots are there simply for backup. In reality though, flying is a hands-on job. It needs constant attention and a skilled flight crew. There once was a plane that flew twice faster than the speed of sound. Hmm, can it be true, or is it too far-fetched? This fact is definitely not a myth. The Concorde could reach a speed of 1,330 miles per hour. That's much faster than the speed of sound, which is around 767 miles per hour. And that's indeed almost twice as slow as the Concorde. You might have heard this scary fact before. Planes empty toilets right in the air. Sounds alarming, but is it true? Fortunately, that's only a myth. There's absolutely nothing to this legend. Airplane toilets use a vacuum-based system to transport all the contents out of the bowl and into a special tank. It's located in the rear part of the aircraft, and this tank gets emptied only on the ground. Ah, this is a tricky one. When a plane is flying towards the east, it can reach higher speeds. So, can the speed really depend on the direction? And this is true. It's possible thanks to high-altitude winds, known as jet streams. They blow at a speed of 100 to 300 miles per hour. And since our planet rotates from west to east, aircraft moving in the same direction can use these winds to move faster. Do you think pilots can control airflow to keep passengers sleepy and relaxed and save on fuel? This one is definitely a myth. If you ask a pilot this question, you might hear ridiculous in reply. The truth is that pressurization determines the oxygen level in the cabin. How about this one? The world's tallest air traffic control tower is as high as a skyscraper. Can it be true? Or is it just an impressive myth? I know it's hard to believe, but it's actually true. When an airplane lands, it needs the assistance of runway lights and airport beacons. It's part of the responsibilities of the air traffic control tower. It also manages ground traffic. 
No wonder such construction needs to be extra tall. The new Bangkok International Airport in Thailand has a 430-foot four-tall tower. Its height is almost the same as the height of a 40-story building. It cost $18 million to build the tower. I've got another tough one for you. The sensitivity of your taste buds dropped by 30% during the flight. Yes or no? This is true. The pressure in the cabin combined with the dryness of the air kind of numbs your taste buds. But the most curious thing here is that this mostly affects salty and sweet flavors. If you're served something spicy or bitter, you can still taste it as usual. Airline caterers try to take the decreased sensitivity of your taste buds into account while preparing airplane meals. They have to modify lots of good old recipes to make your food taste better. As soon as your oxygen mask is on, in case the cabin is depressurized, you can relax and breathe out. You can still use it till the end of the flight. I wish it was true, but is it? Sadly, it's a myth. Passenger oxygen masks usually provide enough air to breathe normally for 10 to 15 minutes. In other words, it's just a temporary solution. But in most cases, this time is enough for the plane to go down to the altitude of 10,000 feet. That's where people can breathe without using oxygen masks. And since planes descend very fast, the need for additional oxygen lasts for a few minutes at most. By the way, the oxygen system gets tested regularly during special maintenance checks. Plus, both passengers' and pilots' oxygen flow doesn't depend on electricity. Masks use individual oxygen generators, so even if there's some electrical problem on board, the oxygen doesn't get cut off. Many people say that the plane is the safest means of travel, but do you believe in it? That's a myth. Flying is the second safest. Studies show that the elevator is safer. Unfortunately, it won't be able to take you to the Bahamas. Okay, this last one was kind of a joke. Statistically, planes are indeed the safest way to get to your destination. So, how many correct answers did you have? Tell me in the comments below. Me, eight. Duh. The plane had been in the air for a mere 25 seconds when the pilots noticed weird noises and bizarre vibrations. They tried several ways to improve the situation, but nothing worked. The engine surges continued, and just over a minute into the flight, when the plane reached 3,000 feet, both engines failed. First the right one, two seconds later the left one. The pilots decided to return to the airport they had just left. At the same time, they tried to restart the engines. Nothing seemed to work. The flight crew made a decision to pitch the plane down and then level it off. Perhaps it could help them gain some speed for the glide. But soon, they realized they wouldn't make it to the airport. Was the plane going to crash? That's when the miracle at Gotrura occurred. The morning before the flight started as usual. Regular pre-flight procedures, good weather. The members of the flight crew were experienced pilots. A 44-year-old Danish captain with over 8,000 flight hours under his belt and a 34-year-old first officer from Sweden with 3,000 hours. So, what could go wrong? The plane itself was almost brand new. It was a McDonnell Douglas MD-81, nicknamed Dana Viking. It made its first flight on March 16, 1991. By that fateful day, the aircraft had been in service for a mere nine months. There were 122 passengers and seven crew members on board. Flight 751 Scandinavian Airlines was a scheduled flight from Stockholm, Sweden to Warsaw, Poland. On the way, the plane was supposed to make a stop in Copenhagen, Denmark. The aircraft took off from Stockholm according to its schedule at 8.47 a.m. local time. But by that point, the people inside had already been doomed, all because of a terrible sequence of events before the departure. It started the night before. The plane arrived at Stockholm Airport after a flight from Zurich. It was 10.09 p.m. The aircraft spent the night at the gate outside. It was cold. The temperature dropped to 34 degrees Fahrenheit, just above freezing. What made the situation even worse was that almost 6,000 pounds of freezing cold fuel, chilled during the night, still remained in the tanks located in the wings. 
The fuel was so cold because the plane had been flying at the cruising altitude, where the air temperature outside the cabin varied from minus 61 to minus 80 degrees. The flight from Zurich lasted around 1 hour and 40 minutes. Soon after midnight, a flight technician came to check on the aircraft. The man had to remove some slush from the landing gear, otherwise he wouldn't be able to examine it. At around 2 a.m., when he was leaving, he noticed some ice covering the upper part of the wings. By the morning, the situation had become even dire. A layer of clear, almost invisible ice had formed on the tops of the wings. The plane had to leave the gate at around 8.30 a.m. An hour before the departure, the mechanic responsible for the plane noticed that some ice covered the underside of the wings. He decided to make sure there was no ice on the tops of the wings. He climbed a ladder and put one knee on the wing. Then he bent forward to touch the front part of the wing. There was no ice, just some slush. The mechanic decided to make sure everything was fine with the air inlet of one of the engines. He didn't find anything abnormal. Soon after that, the personnel used more than 220 gallons of de-icing fuel to remove ice from the plane. The mechanic consulted with the captain of the aircraft and ordered the staff to de-ice the underside of the wings as well. After all, he had seen some ice there. But no one thought to double-check if there was clear ice on the tops of the wings. After they had finished the procedure, the mechanic reported to the captain, uh, We're done here. The icing finished. There was a lot of snow and ice, but everything's clear now. The captain thanked the mechanic and carried on with the pre-flight procedures. The plane taxied to the runway. Its engine's anti-ice systems were switched on and didn't show any malfunction. But several passengers later claimed they had seen ice sliding off the upper side of the wings while the plane had been taking off. And still, the plane left the ground and headed for Stockholm as usual. But shortly after the takeoff, several pieces of the overlooked ice broke off. At full speed, they slammed into the fans of the engines near the tail on both sides of the plane, ruining the blades. It led to a series of surges, and the rest is history. Meanwhile, somewhere in the cabin, Scandinavian Airlines flight captain Per Holmberg, who was on board as a passenger, noticed something was amiss. At first, he informed the flight attendant sitting in the rear jump seat that the right engine was surging. She tried to contact the flight crew, unsuccessfully. Then, the ununiformed captain rushed to the cockpit and asked if he could help the pilots. The first officer gave him the emergency checklist, and the captain asked him to start the auxiliary power unit, a small gas turbine in the tail of the plane. Holmberg's advice and help were invaluable. But was it enough to save the plane and the people inside? When the plane emerged from the cloud cover at an altitude of 890 feet, the pilots realized they wouldn't have enough time to make it back to the airport. An immediate emergency landing was unavoidable. The assisting captain passed the order to the cabin crew, and they started preparing the passengers. There was a large field to the north of the plane, but the captain realized they didn't have enough time to reach it. So he chose a much smaller field in a forested area in the direction of flight. It was not far from the village of Gotrura in upland Sweden. The plane was just 1,300 feet above the ground when the assisting captain started extending the flaps. At a height of 183 feet, the captain reported to Stockholm Control, We're crashing to the ground! Seven seconds later, the plane hit several trees and lost a huge chunk of its right wing. By that time, the landing gear had already been extended and the speed had decreased to 139 miles per hour. Moments later, the plane's tail struck the ground and broke off. The aircraft kept sliding across the field, still at high speed. It traveled 360 feet, with its main landing gear leaving marks on the field. At one point, the plane lost the main and nose landing gear. Its fuselage broke into three parts. Miraculously, there was no fire. If you look at the pictures from the crash site, the plane torn into pieces with its parts scattered across the field, it's hard to believe that all 129 people on board the plane survived. It seems like a miracle, but it was also thanks to the flight attendant's quick reaction 
and the correct instructions they gave the passengers. They didn't panic and told the people to adopt the brace position just in time to avoid fatalities. Even more surprising, almost all passengers, except for four people, made their way out of the plane on their own. No wonder this accident was nicknamed the Miracle. The aircraft, though, wasn't as lucky. The nine-month-old plane was damaged so badly that it was an immediate write-off. Everyone praised the actions of the flight crew. The landing was incredibly skilled, especially in such a fast-developing, very dangerous situation. The captain himself admitted that few pilots were ever forced to put to the test the skills they got during training at least not to this degree. He said he was proud of his crew and relieved that everyone had survived. And he never returned to piloting commercial planes. You've probably seen Hollywood movies where somehow a small hole opens up in the side of a plane and then immediately it's utter chaos. Food trays and bags flying, seat belts barely holding passengers in place. Luckily, in reality, small damage to the fuselage won't cause such dramatic consequences. But would you believe me if I told you there was a pilot that managed to land a plane with half the roof torn completely off? Buckle up. At 1.25 p.m. on April 28, 1988, a 19-year-old Boeing 737 that belonged to Aloha Airlines left Hilo International Airport and headed for Honolulu. The plane was named after Queen Lilio Kalani, who was the last sovereign monarch of the Kingdom of Hawaii. On that day, the aircraft already had three short flights from Honolulu to Hilo, Maui, and Kauai. Apologies to the people of Hawaii for any mispronounced names. Anyway, all the trips were regular and uneventful. The weather was calm, and it seemed like nothing could go wrong. The captain was experienced pilot Robert Shorns Timer, 44 years old who had 6,700 flight hours in the Boeing 737. The first officer was Madeline Tompkins, 36 years old, who had flown more than 3,500 hours in the very same Boeing model. Early in the morning, still in Honolulu, the first officer had conducted the regular pre-flight inspection and announced that the plane was ready for the flight. At 11 a.m., the plane left Honolulu and headed for Maui and then to Hilo. When the plane arrived at the destination, the pilots didn't leave the cockpit or inspect the aircraft from the outside. After all, it wasn't a requirement, so they didn't have to. Following schedule, the plane started the last leg on their routine round trip at 1.25 p.m. There were 95 people on board the aircraft, 89 passengers, two pilots, three flight attendants, and an FAA traffic controller who stayed in the observer seat in the cockpit. After a normal takeoff and ascent, The plane got to the usual cruising altitude of 24,000 feet, and then, at about 1.48 p.m., 26 miles away from Kaolui, the unexpected happened. Those who were in the cockpit heard a loud whooshing sound, and then a crack, followed by the deafening sound of wind seconds later. Apparently, a small part of the roof on the left side tore loose, which led to the explosive decompression of the plane. But the worst thing was that the decompression caused a ripple effect which led to a huge section of the airplane's roof to tear off completely. The length of the missing part was 18.5 feet long. It was all part of the aircraft's skin that covered the plane from the cockpit back to the four-wing area. At first, the pilots didn't realize what had happened. The first officer, who was in control of the aircraft at that moment, felt her head jerk backward and she noticed debris and gray pieces of insulation flying chaotically around the cockpit. When the captain turned his head, he saw that the cockpit door had disappeared, and instead of the first-class ceiling, he was staring at a clear blue sky. The plane started to roll from side to side, and it was becoming increasingly harder to control. Everybody who was in the cockpit immediately put on their oxygen masks, and the captain took over the aircraft. He prodded the speed brakes into action and began an emergency descent towards the nearest airport, which was on Maui Island. Luckily, all the passengers were in their seats at the moment when the accident happened, and since the seatbelt sight was still on, everyone had their seatbelts fastened. However, all three flight attendants were standing along the aircraft aisle. The one who was the closest to the front of the plane was swept out through the hole in the roof. The other two were thrown to the floor by a forceful jerk. 
But while one of them hit her head really hard and lost consciousness, the other one started to crawl along the aisle in an attempt to help passengers and calm them down. At that same time, the pilots were trying to contact air traffic control and signal an emergency. To make matters worse, they couldn't hear each other and had to use gestures to communicate. They also didn't know whether the radio worked and whether they had managed to deliver their message. The flight controls were sluggish and loose, and the captain was struggling to control the plane. The first officer, right by his side, dealing with communication and assisting the captain. It turned out that the controller hadn't been receiving the crew's messages until the aircraft descended to the altitude of 14,000 feet. Only then did the signal get through and Maui Tower started urgent preparations for an emergency landing. The problem was that at that time, in case of an emergency, the airport control tower had to dial 911 just like anyone else. On top of that, the controller didn't catch that the passengers and crew members would need medical help. After all, the crew only announced that they had experienced a rapid decompression, so the controller wasn't aware of the entire gravity of the situation. In the meantime, the plane had already dropped to a height of 10,000 feet above sea level. The captain removed his oxygen mask and withdrew the speed brakes. The plane was steadily descending toward runway 2 of Kaolui Airport. Following the captain's command, the first officer lowered the landing gear, but the indicator light didn't come on. That could mean that either they had a bad light, or they had serious problems with the nose gear. But that wasn't the only problem. As the plane was approaching the runway, the left engine failed, and the aircraft started rocking and shaking. The captain made an attempt to restart the engine, but didn't succeed. And yet still, with the help of the reverse thrust of the second still working engine, at 1.58 p.m., just 10 minutes after the emergency and 35 minutes after the takeoff, Aloha Airlines Flight 243 did manage to touch down on the runway of Kaolui Airport and come to a complete stop. Landing a plane with such a huge loss of integrity was an unprecedented feat. As soon as the plane stopped, the evacuation began. Everyone on the plane, except for the one flight attendant who had been pulled out of the plane, was alive, although 65 people were injured. Most people had been hurt by flying debris and torn pieces of fuselage. Unfortunately, since nobody on the ground had known how serious the situation was, no ambulances were waiting for the injured. The first one arrived seven minutes after the plane landed, and there were only two ambulances on the entire island, which obviously couldn't fit all the people. That's why the passengers had to be transported to the hospital in several 15-passenger tour vans that belonged to the company Akamai Tours. Luckily, two Akamai drivers used to be paramedics, so they started to tend to the injured right on the runway. Meanwhile, airport mechanics, as well as office staff, drove the vans to the hospital, which was three miles away. Luckily, there were only eight serious injuries, from which all of these passengers later recovered. As for the plane, it was damaged beyond repair and later dismantled right at the airport. The missing part of the roof disappeared and was never seen again. But what could cause such a terrible accident? The problem wasn't the age of the aircraft. 19 years isn't that old for a commercial plane. And it hadn't accumulated too many flight hours before the accident happened. But the 35,500 flight hours the plane had traveled included 89,680 takeoffs and landings, which are also called flight cycles. The reason for such a huge number was that the plane performed mostly short domestic flights between the islands. And this number exceeded the number of flight cycles the plane was designed for twice over. Besides, the plane traveled in a salty and humid environment, which also added to the wear and tear. Interestingly, during one interview that followed the accident, passenger Gail Yamamoto remembered that she had spotted a crack in the fuselage when she was boarding. Unfortunately, she was the only one who had seen the damage, and the woman hadn't thought that the crack was important enough to inform the crew. It's important to stress that these kinds of accidents are extremely rare these days. According to Harvard University, given all the steps and measures major airlines and airports take to ensure safety, the odds of you being in an airplane accident is roughly 1 in 1.2 million. That's a 0.000083% chance. I don't know about you, but I like those odds. And even if something were to happen, like, for example, 
have the roof falling off. It's a great comfort to know that your trained pilots can still land the plane relatively safely. That little yellow hook you can see from the airplane's window if you're sitting next to the wing is there to help you in case of an emergency landing. Inflatable slides can only be deployed from the emergency exit doors in the front and the tail of the plane. In the middle, the passengers would have to walk right out on the wing and get to the ground from there. But jumping from the plane wing isn't safe because it's just too high. And here's where those little yellow hooks come in handy. The flight attendants tie ropes from the doors and through the loops for the passengers to hold on to. This way, everyone can safely get to the ground without injuries. Now, you want to try to avoid cozying up under airplane blankets. Some airlines only wash them about once a month. Better use your own travel blanket, a scarf, or a jacket. And always remember to wear your shoes while walking around the plane. That carpet on the floor can't and won't be cleaned to perfection between flights. It's just too much time and effort for the cabin crew. The dirtiest place on a plane isn't the bathroom. It's your tray table. It has 8 times more bacteria than an onboard toilet flush button. Now, in case of emergency, oxygen masks only have enough airflow to last for about 15 minutes. Luckily, it's just the amount of time a plane needs to find a suitable landing place or to at least descend to the altitude where people won't need oxygen masks anymore. You may wonder why you're asked to lift your seat back and close your tray table before takeoff and landing, but it's for your own safety. A reclined seat is comfy for you, but it makes it harder for the passenger behind you to get out of their seat, which is crucial in case of an emergency. The lower tray table is the same way, only this time it's you who won't be able to stand up fast enough if anything happens. Besides, the tray table prevents you from assuming the secure position in the event of an emergency landing. This position requires you to bend over in your seat, put your head between your knees, and cover the back of your head with your hands. Imagine doing that while your tray table is open. If you look around the cabin, you'll notice little black or red triangles around the midsection of the plane. These stickers let the flight attendants know where the airplane wings are located so they can immediately look out the right window to see if something is amiss outside. You shouldn't lower the window shades while taking off, taxiing, or landing for two reasons. First, the flight attendants must always be able to monitor the situation outside, and open shades help them with that, obviously. Second, if something's gone wrong on board the plane while it's on the ground, for example, a fire, the ground crews won't be able to see it and evaluate the situation before going in unless the windows are open. That tiny hole you see at the bottom of any airplane window isn't there to scare you nuts. In fact, it helps keep the pressure from the inside and the outside of the window equalized. The hole itself is only made in the second layer of glass, and there are three of them overall, which also helps with security, by the way. Even if the outer glass breaks, there will still be two more to keep you safe. Now, you might see flight attendants touching the overhead compartments while they're walking along the aisle, but that's not exactly what they do. Right beneath the compartments, there's usually a handrail that goes all the way through the cabin, so you can also use this trick to stay firmer on your feet in the aisle. The pilots dim the lights in the cabin during nighttime not for you to get cozy and sleepy. Our eyes have a hard time adjusting to darkness in the first few minutes of sudden lights out. And in the case of emergency, every second matters. So the lights get dimmed to let you get used to darkness in case something happens and you have to act fast. Pay attention to the aisle floor, too. If there's an emergency landing at night, there will be two luminescent strips along the aisle showing you the way to the exit. Follow them to get safely out of the plane. Flight attendants also suggest counting the seats between you and the emergency exit once you're seated. This will help you navigate in case there's no other guidance available. If a lightning bolt hits the plane, the passengers won't feel it. The entire aircraft is covered with aluminum coating that conducts electrical current and doesn't let it inside. This protection is tested using a lightning simulator. 
Airplane windows are round because the air pressure is evenly distributed this way. If the plane's windows were square, strong air currents would accumulate in the corners of the windows, depressurizing the cabin. And that's bad. Don't think you become untouchable if you go to the airplane toilet. The bathroom door can be opened from the outside. There's usually a small latch at the top of the door that allows cabin crew to get you out of there. It's useful for both getting to people doing something suspicious in the bathroom and helping those who don't feel well and, for example, collapsed while in the toilet. Yeah, let's avoid doing that. The plane's wings flash red and green lights at night to show the direction the plane is heading in. A green light is always on the right wing, and a red one is on the left. Aircraft tires are designed to withstand 4-5 to five times more pressure than they actually experience upon landing. The wheel is more likely to break than the tire. Pilots always have different meals. This is necessary to reduce the risk of food poisoning. The flight can still go well if one of the pilots has gone down because of a stale burrito, but not if it's both of them. And try not to both of you eat the fish. Some airlines don't allow pilots to have beards. Facial hair can prevent securely fitting the oxygen mask, and pilots must always remain conscious. The seats are blue in most aircraft because this color soothes people. It's also easy to keep clean. The rumbling noise you hear after boarding the plane is luggage being loaded on the plane. The compartment is right beneath the cabin, so it can sound quite loud sometimes. On most flights longer than 7 or 8 hours, pilots have access to a specially designed rest seat in or near the cockpit. Flight attendants typically have a section of the cabin reserved for them, and it's sometimes separated from the passenger areas. Some larger aircraft even feature private crew quarters above or below the main cabin. The wings of most passenger aircraft are located at the bottom of the plane. It's called a low wing. Firstly, if you install the engine under low wings, it'll be closer to the ground and easier to repair. Secondly, the wings will take on part of the shock in case of a hard landing. And if the plane falls into the water, then the wings become a life-saving pillow. By the way, a plane can stay afloat for 10 minutes to 60 hours. It all depends on the model of the plane, weather conditions, and pilot skills. Now, most airplanes are white because this color best reflects the sun rays and the aircraft body doesn't heat up as much. Also, the damage is best seen on white, and white paint is simply cheaper. Shoulder straps seem more secure than just a waist belt, But not in the case of planes. When the plane gets into turbulence, it's tossed a bit in the air. The waist belt will simply hold you in place in case of a more severe shake. Shoulder straps would require more space between the seats, and this is not justified on a plane. In a car, the impact is usually much stronger, so you need that shoulder strap not to whoosh through the windshield. Flight attendant seats do have passenger straps, but that's because they are much less comfortable than passenger ones. They're narrower and positioned facing the passengers. Flight attendants need extra protection simply not to fall off their seats if the plane shakes hard enough. Also, they have to help and direct people during potential evacuation. And for that, they need to be in top shape. Now, maybe you've noticed that you always enter the plane from its left side. Firstly, the captain usually sits on that side. This way, it's easier for the captain to align the plane with the terminal jet bridge. Also, the aircraft is fueled and loaded with the baggage on the right side. If passengers come from the left, the crew can do their job undisturbed. How can spiders survive when they lose a leg? When they're in a dangerous situation and try to run away, They can lose legs and regrow them only a couple months later. They'll survive without any problem because most of the time, their legs come off at break points. Those are joints that contain muscles and constrict, which help spiders minimize blood loss. If they lose a leg at the part that comes before the break point, the spider still sheds it, but it will lose more blood. It will be harder for the animal to recover in this case. 
Speaking of spiders, have you noticed how they sometimes stay extremely still for a long time? They're motionless while waiting for potential prey to land in their web. When moving around, they waste energy and drive unnecessary attention to themselves. Either a hungry bird praying for a quick snack will see it, or a spider will remain hungry because flies will be less likely to come near their web. When spinning a web, they waste a lot of energy. Even after the web is finished, a spider may have to wait for days or weeks to catch something. So, it's important to save as much energy as possible. Hunting spiders are way more active, but the majority of them are nocturnal predators. They spend their days relaxing, tucked away under a rock or in a nest. Roast potatoes can stay hot for a really long time, and this mostly has to do with the fatty, starchy crust that's like some sort of an insulating layer. When you pre-boil a potato, this causes its starch granules to absorb water and swell until carb molecules seep out to produce this type of thick gel. Since potatoes are in the oven, high temperatures drive off moisture. This makes the gelatinized starch on the outside of the potato chunk and creates a crispy crust. This crust traps the heat inside. The fat from the baking tray collects in cracks too, and the heat-keeping structure stays strong. Birds don't get electrocuted while perching on power lines because it's not voltages that will harm them, but voltage differences. And electricity wouldn't flow without them. So, if you see a bird standing on a single power line at, for example, 35,000 volts, the lack of a voltage difference is something that keeps the animal safe. But if it accidentally extends its wings and touches another power line that's at a different voltage, it won't end well. That's the reason why electricity companies make sure there's plenty of space between the cables. Have you ever wondered why airplane pilots won't try to land on grass when the landing gear doesn't deploy? The grass may seem like a good solution at first because it's soft, true. But the surface will neither be smooth nor even. When pressure is high, landing on grass can lead to unpredictable movements and cause issues such as structure formation. That happens because of bouncing and unequal pressure. This can even result in fuel leakage and prevent the doors from opening. Bald heads tend to be shiny, even though the skin elsewhere on the human body isn't. Most of our skin is covered with tiny hairs that give it some sort of velvety peach fuzz look. With male pattern baldness, the hair follicles tend to shrink and turn into skin cells, which means there's no hair there at all. And the scalp is especially shiny due to the sebaceous glands. They produce and secrete some kind of oily matter that protects our skin. Sebaceous glands are located all across our skin, but the scalp has way more of them. So, this oil coats the skin, which is why it turns into a more reflective surface. House cats will rarely meow at one another, but they become chatty with humans, and this could be related to domestication. The process of taming cats and keeping them as pets started nearly 10,000 years ago. Before that, Cats were pretty much loners. They rarely encountered other cats, so they didn't even have to use their voices to communicate with each other. Instead, they communicated through their sense of smell, which included things like rubbing against a certain object, for example, a tree. So they didn't even have to come face to face with other members of their species to send a message. And that's how they mostly communicate today as well. But humans don't have such a good sense of smell as cats, so these foxy creatures had to think of a way to send us a message and still get what they wanted from us, which turned out to be meowing. If you're planning a day trip to a desert, for example, the Sahara in North Africa, you're going to want to bring good sunscreen and a lot of water, of course, but also a snug sleeping bag if you're planning to spend the night there too. Deserts really become cold during the night. In the Sahara, Temperatures go from an average high of 100 degrees Fahrenheit during the day to 25 degrees during the night. Such dramatic change happens because of two main factors, humidity and sand. Sand doesn't retain heat that well. When light and heat from the sun reach a desert, sand grains from the top layer absorb heat. But they release it back into the air relatively quickly. So during the day, the sand radiates the energy coming from the sun, which eventually heats the air and leads to extremely high temperatures. And during the night, the sand is quickly losing heat once again. But this time, there's no sunlight that would reheat the desert. That leaves the sand colder than before and leads to such low temperatures. In arid deserts such as the Atacama Desert in Chile and the Sahara, the humidity is extremely low. 
That means the amount of water vapor in the air is almost zero. Unlike sand, water does well to store heat. Water vapor in the air traps heat close to the ground. It's like you cover the ground with a huge blanket. That way, you stop it from dissipating into the atmosphere. Also, when the air has a high level of humidity, it requires more energy to heat up. That means it takes more time for that same energy to disappear and for the surroundings to get colder. Since there's almost no humidity in deserts, such areas can both quickly heat up and cool down. If you microwave water for tea, it will taste worse than when it's made with a kettle. That's because the temperature of the liquid is the main factor for a good tea. Water should reach a rolling boil before you pour it over tea leaves, whether they're loose or bagged. It's an easy thing to do with tea kettles, both the electric and stovetop varieties. When the burner or the electric heating element is on, the water at the bottom of the vessel warms up. As it's getting hotter, water through the rest of the kettle comes to the boiling point. A microwave doesn't heat from the bottom up. It creates electromagnetic waves that randomly jump around the box. You probably notice when you try to reheat leftovers, they end up partially frozen in some spots and extremely hot in others. The same will happen with water because it's hard to control microwave energy. Overheated liquid won't be good for tea either. When water goes above 212 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the boiling point for water, it can destroy the compounds that give a tea its specific flavor. Have you ever wondered why those electrical plugs most Americans use have holes in the prongs? The story dates back to the early 20th century when Harvey Hubble Jr. invented different types of electrical plugs. He started with the detachable electric plug, which was the first ever of that type. Some of his designs had prongs with indents, those aligned with tiny bumps inside the electrical sockets. Such an indent and bump system secured the prongs in place after people would insert a plug into a socket. At some point, these indents gave way to holes, which worked in the same way. But that's just part of the story. Most of the modern outlets don't even have bumps anymore. They keep plugs from falling out of the wall by using friction and pressure. Today, some manufacturers insert a rod through all the holes in a line of prongs. That's how they lock them in place while encasing them in plastic. Some also say the holes save metal which cuts costs of manufacturing in the long term. All right, window seat on a flight to Hawaii. You get comfy and are about to have the flight of your life. As it goes on, you look out to the darkness and can't even see the clouds as you're cruising above the ocean. You notice that the flight attendant is asking everyone to shut the shades on the windows, including yours. The reason is that they want the passengers to be comfortable with the lighting. If an emergency happens, it'll take your eyes more time to adjust if there is light coming from the outside of the plane and the inside. If a power outage happens and the shades are shut, it'll be easier to act since your eyes are adjusted to the surroundings. Every second counts during times like this. Passengers are asked to leave the shades open during takeoffs during the day. And during a day flight, the cabin crew also asks passengers to leave the shades open so that the natural light outside illuminates the plane's interior. Now, there has never been an incident in history where a phone's signal interference caused any problems during a flight. The idea is that when you're thousands of feet in the sky, your phone signal will bounce off different towers and the signal will get more powerful. This normally won't be a problem in mid-flight when the pilots aren't doing much work. The real concentration and critical moments are during the landing and the takeoff. The phone signals will just flood the networks on the ground, which will make the pilot's job just a little bit more annoying. Now, it seems to bother you that the windows on the plane are so small given the improved technology over the years. The windows on airplanes are so small relative to the size because they need to maximize the hull between them and increase the strength of the frame. The overall frame over the plane is actually at its strongest if there aren't any windows at all. Metal fatigue occurs over time, originating at the weak points of the plane. The bigger the windows, the weaker the frame. You lift the shades just to take a peek outside. You're so far from the ground, it looks like you're actually closer to space than Earth. But you're only 7% the distance from where astronauts go. Planes can technically go higher than that, 
But they can't because it won't be good for the passengers and the crew members. Planes can sometimes cause lightning storms during a cloudy flight. But don't worry, you're safe. The static creates lightning whenever a plane passes through, and it can strike while it's moving. But over the years, technological advancements improve the quality of airplanes. The electrical current of lightning is distributed throughout the aluminum structure so that it doesn't affect the controls. Some people start panicking on the flight. All the windows are shut because the flash of lightning is disturbing for many people who are trying to sleep. One person panics a little too much and tries to open the exterior door in mid-flight. Well, this is almost impossible to do because of internal pressure. You'd have to be a superhero to open it up. The plane exit the cloud cluster back into normal sky. The flight attendants are bringing out some dinner. You pull out your tray and wipe it clean. It's reported that this is the dirtiest part of the plane. Nope, not even the toilet. After cleaning it, they serve some chicken and little veggies on the side. The smell is incredible, but when you take a bite, it somehow doesn't taste as good. It's because the difference in air pressure and the low humidity alters your taste buds, especially the sweet tooth part and the salty buds. Only a few hours left until you arrive at your destination. You wake up, and the flight attendants ask you to put on your seatbelt and tuck in your tray. The plane lands and parks. You're the last one out and make your way to the baggage claim. The conveyor belt rotates, but you don't see your bags. When flights lose your baggage, there's a pretty good chance that they're still in the location where you traveled from. Occasionally, they can end up on other flights due to human error. The flight agencies can recover your luggage if you file that they're missing. You read the signs on the flight destination screen showing the arrivals and departures. These signs are written in three specific fonts so that people can read them from afar while walking. As you continue walking, you stare out into the large window panels. These windows are made of special material. It makes you feel like you're closer to your plane than when you look through regular ones. You notice they're driving the bags to the planes for loading and refueling them before takeoff. They fill up the planes with just enough fuel to take them to their destination, rather than pumping them with a little extra. That's because they need the planes to be as light as possible, since fuel is heavy. You head outside and feel the hot wind of Hawaii in your hair. It's only a matter of time before you're dipping your feet in the ocean water. You try to find a taxi, but they're all taken. Taxis are yellow because a salesman in 1907 had a lot of cars in his lot and didn't know what to do with them. He decided to start a taxi business to make use of those idle cars. To make them stand out from the rest of the cars, he decided to color them yellow. According to a survey, yellow cars are the easiest to spot on the street. School buses also use yellow to stick out from the crowd. Colors are important in our daily lives, just like the colors of a traffic light or the flashy red color of a stop sign. But it wasn't always red. In the early 1900s, the red dye wasn't consistent and faded over time. So they used yellow instead. In the 1950s, they finally started using a red color that didn't fade away and white lettering for stop. Well, you finally find a cab and enter. You're so tired and decide to shut your eyes for a bit. Scientists still don't know why we need sleep, but it has to do with resting our brains so that we can function for the next day. You get stuck in traffic and are jolted up by the sound of honking cars. You look out the window and see the ocean filled with people. Instead of waiting in the taxi, you pay your fare, grab your bags that the airline finally found, and head down to the beach. You dip your feet and pick up a large seashell. You put it against your ear to hear the ocean. Of course, you don't exactly hear the ocean, but different frequencies of the ambient noise inside the shell echoing around. The sound just happens to resemble the ocean. You take off your shoes to feel the sand on your feet, but it's so hot that you tiptoe your way to a shady spot. The sand absorbs the heat and can retain it. 85% of sunlight can also reflect off sand and water. You open your bags and get out your towel and lay it on a soft spot. Even though you're sitting in some shape, you're still at risk of getting a sunburn. So you apply some cream to protect yourself. SPF stands for Sun Protection Factor, and the numbers mean how long it will take for the UV rays to affect your skin. After applying it, you dip in the water for a bit 
and see a large volcano in the distance. The sand around is somewhat black. This is because Hawaii is located in a volcanic range. The color of the sand is determined by the location, environment, and source. Most of the sand in the world is made up of quartz and trillions of particles that used to be rock. The deserts of the world used to be forests millions of years ago. But due to climate changes, everything turned to sand. Some parts of the Sahara Desert still have some geological formations suggesting that there used to be large rivers in the region. Not to mention the discovery of aquatic dinosaurs found in those ancient dry rivers. You're finally settled and sipping on a punchy drink. You see some people surfing the large ocean waves. Surfing was technically invented in Hawaii and later became a popular water sport worldwide. You hang out for a bit until sunset and then head to your hotel to take a long shower. Water was not invented in Hawaii, although it is surrounded by it. It's, you know, an island. You can easily remove post-it notes because their adhesive is not even. Sticky notes feature a plastic adhesive. It's spread out in blobs across that sticky part of the paper. When you slap a post-it onto a bulletin board, not all the blobs, that are technically called microcapsules, will actually touch the surface to keep the paper stuck there. You can easily unstick it. And then, when you want to reattach it to something else, those blobs of glue that are left unused will take over the role of the adhesive. Eventually, you'll use all the capsules of glue, or they'll simply get clogged with dirt. So, the note won't stick anymore. It's very satisfying to chew gum because it's made of rubber. Gum from before had an elastic texture because of something called chicle, a natural type of latex rubber. Now you can chew your bubble gum easily because it's made of synthetic rubber. Some of these are used in car tires too, while others are used in Elmer's glue because they mimic the effect of chicle. Office buildings are a bit taller during the night. When the employees are finished with work, they all go home. Tall office buildings get slightly taller. For example, a 1,300-foot tall skyscraper will shrink about 0.03 inches under the weight of 50,000 people inside, assuming they're all an average weight. You could actually heat your house with just 70 people. If you've ever been trapped in a small crowded room, you know people give off body heat. So you'd need about 70 people in motion to warm up your home in the winter using just their body heat or maybe 140 people standing still. If you consider the house uses four electrical storage heaters and humans radiate approximately 100 to 200 watts of heat in normal conditions. Why does glass break so easily? It's because its atoms are not very tightly arranged. Unlike other solid material like metal, glass is made up of amorphous, which basically means structureless, loosely packed and randomly arranged atoms. These atoms can't rearrange themselves that quickly to retain a firm structure, so glass collapses and fragments shatter everywhere. Do you know why airplane passenger windows are mostly below eye level? Aircraft are way cheaper, stronger, and easier to build without windows, but they're there because many people like the view. Particularly about 100 years ago when flights were often conducted at low altitudes. Also, if some passengers are feeling sick, looking out the window can help them reconnect their sense of balance, as their eyes are continually reporting what's going on around them. Windows in this position also help distribute the load around them more evenly. The floor of the cabin where people sit isn't all the way at the bottom of the aircraft, which is why windows end up being quite low compared to both the overall volume of the cabin itself and the eye level of the passengers sitting down. Water feels colder than air at the same temperature because it's denser. Because of that, your body loses heat 25 times faster while surrounded by water than it would if it was surrounded by air that was the same temperature. Since it's so dense, water has a high heat capacity, which means it takes a lot of heat to raise its temperature just a little bit. Water is good at both retaining heat and cold. That's why the ocean is way cooler than land, and at the same time, the hot soup stays hot for a long time. Water is also a pretty good conductor, which means it effectively transfers either heat or cold to the human body. Have you ever wondered why water cleans so well? It's because of its asymmetrical molecules. They are made of two hydrogen atoms stuck to a single oxygen atom, which means they're triangular. That's why they have a slightly different charge on their different sides, similar to a magnet. 
the oxygen end of the molecule is slightly negative, while the hydrogen is slightly positive. Because of this feature, water is great at sticking to other molecules. So, when you want to wash away dirt, water molecules will stick to the dirt. They'll pull it away from the surface the dirt was on, no matter what it is. This is why water has surface tension. It's capable of sticking to itself, too. House cats share some similarities with big wild cats, but one of the things that sets them apart is their vocalization. The majority of large cats, like tigers and lions, will roar loudly so everyone knows they're coming to defend their territory. But with house cats, most of the time, you'll just hear purrs and meows. That's because of the physiology of their throat and voice box, which helps create these feline vocalizations. So a cat can either roar or purr, but no cat can do both. Bobcats, cougars, house cats, cheetahs, they purr. Purring is specific because a cat creates it when it breathes in and when it breathes out. Roaring has evolved in a particular lineage of big cats, which includes tigers, lions, jaguars, and leopards, except the snow leopard, who lost this ability. They are capable of roaring because of the bendy bones in their throat. Mammals have their voice box in the throat, where air passing by its structures produces sounds. The vocal cords in the hyoid bones are the two main parts of the larynx that create different vocalizations in cats. You probably also prefer the pulse setting on your blender. And why wouldn't you? It just works better. And that's because of turbulence. When a blender stops chopping up food and starts spinning it around in circles only, everything you put inside is spinning at the same rate. It's not really about blending ingredients together, but about something called laminar flow. That means all the layers of liquid are continuously moving in the same direction. When you use the pulse function, your blender adds turbulence. So the fruit chunks are not just rolling around the sides of the blender, but they are falling into the center, which is when it's easier to blend them. So you'd like to open your window during a warm spring or summer day. It's so nice to hear the birds singing, and even when you come back an hour later, you'll probably still hear them singing the same song. They're hard workers, and the males are most likely guarding their territory and trying to attract a female. And other animals have their own tactics. Some like to rub their scent everywhere, but birds use a song to send the message, hey, I'm letting everyone know, especially other males in the area, this is my space. So they'll continue singing the same song over and over again. During the winter, they will most likely sing fewer notes to each other, or just one note. They want to let others know that where they are is their space. Plus, they're trying to figure out if there's any food somewhere nearby. Why do cats like small spaces? First of all, they are solitary animals, which is why they always search for a safe hiding place to take a good nap. And if you see a cat curled in a tiny box, it was probably just trying to find a nice warm spot to sleep and avoid the cold floor. Cats prefer room temperatures to be about 57 degrees Fahrenheit. A bit cooler than this is comfortable for us. And if there isn't a convenient sunbeam to lie in, they will look for other solutions, like a cozy shoebox. Cats are pretty lazy. They can sleep up to 18 hours a day, most average between 10 and 13 hours on a daily basis. The majority of cats are most active during dawn and dusk. They're not the nocturnal animals that some of us think they are, but a specific category called crepuscular animals, together with other creatures like hamsters, ferrets, and stray dogs. Over millions of years, cats have evolved to become low-light predators. Their eyesight is adapted for activities during twilight. And since that's when they're most active, they save their energy for dusk and dawn. Before they became domesticated, Cats would have had to expend large amounts of energy at these times, finding, going after, and catching their prey. House cats no longer need to hunt before each meal, but their natural instincts still encourage them to conserve energy for twilight periods. Why are four-leaf clovers so rare? Similar to animals, plant genes are located in small packages of DNA in the nucleus of each cell. They're called chromosomes. Our chromosomes come in matched pairs, but clovers have four copies of every chromosome per cell. There's a gene responsible for four-leaf clovers, and it's recessive. That means this plant will create four leaves only if it has a four-leaf gene on all four chromosomes. And that's pretty rare. 
Also, some environmental conditions like soil activity and temperature can also affect whether the four leaves appear. Interestingly, these anomalies tend to happen in clusters. So if you find one, look around you, there might be more of them.